Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Leadership Boy Podcast. I'm Enrique with my co-host, Vince. Today, we got a special local Central Florida guest that uh, I know for years now. He's uh, He's been a blessing to my life. So, uh, Vince, I'm going to let you introduce him, and we're going to get into this. Oh, yeah, I am so excited. Ladies and gentlemen, we are excited as well to be here with Eric Doc Wright, founder of Vets 2 p.m., from Melbourne, Florida, right down the street from us here in Orlando. So welcome, Eric. Welcome, Doc. So first, tell us a little bit about you. Well, lads, thanks so much for having me on the podcast. First of all, man, I'm excited. I love supporting local Florida initiatives. Um, yeah, and it's what a treat to see Enrique again, man. It feels like it's been forever, brother. It's probably only been about, uh, what, 13, 14 months now, just right before COVID. Um, so yeah, man, I'm an old grizzled naval nuclear welder. Uh, if I don't stand up straight, I drag knuckles, right? But but at, I didn't know it at the time, but that would be a really great background to parlay 30 years later, right? When I swore I was, I, as a young kid, knew everything. I was never going to go to school. I was never going to do that. I was never going to do this. And here I am 30 years later, man. Bunch of degrees, handful of certifications, you know, several successful businesses and stuff like that. So um it, it was a rough transition. It wasn't always sunshine, rainbows, and puppies, you know. Um, at one point, my transition was so bad. It took about 12 years to figure it out. I'm not the smartest dude in the in the room. Um, you know, there was one night, man, I almost just couldn't do it anymore. I almost shot myself in the face. Uh, but in that moment, thank God, I proved to be a coward. Uh, and I guess that Christian upbringing had something to do with it. So, so anyway, uh, that's kind of why I'm, that's why I'm here and do what I do, man. My mission now is simple, help a military vet achieve a meaningful, lucrative post-service career. If I wake up every day and do that one time, Vince, I kind of earn my rent on the rock for one more day. You know what I mean? I'm living on borrowed time anyway, right? That's uh, amazing. And, uh, and, and thank you, uh, Doc, for sharing that with us. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I know many of the listeners, uh, have either a witness or been part of and uh and thank the lord that you are that you stuck around <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm blessed because of it so um early on when we met it was because vesta pm right that that program has just radically changed the process of going from military to a PM's uh, uh, position and a certification. So please tell us about that. Yeah, you know, Vince, it's so cool. And we're only six years old, man. So the evolution just since you and I first met three or four years ago is just, I mean, what a ride. You know, like I wake up some days and I shave like only that part of my neck, but I when I shave, you know, that little inch slot, like I just can't believe how blessed I am, right? So. I founded a company that allows me to help me execute my, my personal mission every day. So you talk about fulfillment and my company is full of service disabled vets and or patriots, daughters of vets, spouses of vets, right? So when we say we serve the customer, I mean, like we literally are still serving the customer. Like we're like, it's in uniform, right? Cause you guys know vets are skittish critters, right? You get like one chance to like not make good on your word with a vet and then you don't ever get a second chance to win that them back right so you know customer service 24 7 i mean we really uh believe in that stuff so anyway vets the pm man um couple things have happened i've written a number one amazon bestseller it's the cracker jack decoder ring it literally teaches vets the language of of, of the civilian labor force which is management so they learn to speak management they get they prove that fluency with credentials and project management hr management entrepreneurship whatever we've got several tracks and oh by the way those tracks are now indirectly approved because they're in part of our dod approved skill bridge program so that really those two things uh uh vince and and enrique have really just kind of been gas on a on a nice fire we had stoked really well you know pre like a year and a half ago uh but but man it's a bonfire now brother it's throwing off heat grab the marshmallows like it's fun <laughs> i would say going nuclear <laughs> that's right i love it man. i'm gonna steal that vince i'm gonna steal that yes you are my man so congratulations of what you've been doing these last six years and we're very interested to know what what is currently addition to your book well that's awesome 
because that lingo is so important to translate from from military to civilian. A lot of us stumble on that. So that Amazon book is going to be rewarding and, and fulfilling. So what additional is VETS 2, P, 2 p.m. doing? And how are you holding up with this current pandemic? Well, I'll tell you what, man. Like, I'm sure a lot of the listeners, you know, COVID, you know, kicked us in the in the business parts too, man, just like everybody else, right? But we had a couple things going for us. We've always been a we've always been a small company. Uh, we we were built on technology, so we Slack every day, we Zoom every week. Like, so this is all pre-COVID, brother. Um, my G, my my employees are geographically dispersed. My COO is in Texas. My director of career services is in Virginia. Uh, my my uh, senior instructor, uh, my my manager of my cadre, he's in uh, Kentucky. So when it hit, the way we do business didn't really change, right? Except for the fact that the business itself, overnight hiring ground to a complete dead stop in the dead in the water. So did global training. No kidding. I was I was packed and ready to get on a plane at zero dark 30 the Friday, uh, the Thursday night before President Trump announced it like zero seven that morning, lock the OD down. We ain't traveling. I was on my way to Ramstein, man. I'd have been quarantined in an Atlanta airport for 14 days. Thank God. Right. Um, so POTUS comes out early and says, Hey, we're going to, we're going to lock this down and, you know, did all the things he did. So, um, yeah, so those two pieces of our business, which are, you know, core 70, 80% of our revenue, man, bang, instantly vapor locked. So then it was the mantra for the day is I turned to my crew and I said, okay, we got to calibrate the COVID. Like we're going to have to assume we aren't selling a dime until this thing gets better. And now, you know, who knows what's going to happen, man. They're talking about double mask until Thanksgiving of this year. I mean, who knows? But but what we've done at Vestal PM is we've got really crystal clear about, okay, what products and services are we serving our folks with? How's that going to help them? Because here's the deal. Life and professional development and the need to earn a paycheck and feed your family doesn't stop because it's COVID. Right? So we just really had to adjust our marketing and our messaging like, hey, how are we helping? Who's it helping? Why is it helping? And then get really good with our marketing. So for example, on our website right now, we're putting little videos for every FAQ, right? Because we live in a TLDR society, brother. I'm going to read a tweet before I read a paragraph. I'm going to watch a video before I read a paragraph. So we've made everything TLDR. You want to know how to do this? Click the little 92 second video, then go read the paragraph if you want. So We've done a couple of things like that uh, that have really kind of helped us not only hang on, but brother revenue's up 300 plus percent over last quarter. And we just closed the books, right? So thank God, man, it, it, it looks like we got a little lucky. We got a, we got a, a lot of hard work and elbow grease and, and it all kind of worked. <laughs> yeah, no, it, what it looks like is that you guys positioned yourself, right? And, and in business, that's really key, right? To position yourself for any future thing. Now, no one in their right mind had ever could contemplate or even think that this would be that one thing, uh, but, it, but it came. And so, uh, yeah, some initial hurts there, some initial pains, but I think everybody felt those. Uh, but what a, what a victory uh, to say, man, look where we are. And we just closed these books at this, at this you know, margin there uh, and, and profit. So, so kudos to the team, uh, your direction. Uh, we talking about the leadership void, obviously no void there. So, uh, thank you for, for leading that, uh, that effort and, and, and kudos to your team uh, for getting you there. Um, Thanks Enrique. So, and you know, we've kind of, the other thing that we've done that really kind of streets, speaking of strategic positioning and, uh, uh, competitive advantage and all that stuff, right. We've kind of made, uh, we've implemented a new profit sharing program. And so now every single one of my team members is literally an owner. They spend money like it's theirs. They control cost and ex uh, expenses like it's theirs. They generate revenue like it's theirs. Um, they're off the leash now, man. They're all 10 feet tall, eating glass for breakfast and bulletproof, brother. They are killing it. 
because they're each experts in their own right and they kind of own that piece of the business, right? So when you see a man go down, man, we're right there on their position, we're picking them up, we're, we're, we're reacting. So uh, yeah, it's definitely, you know, leadership is the catalyst, the heat that bakes the cake, right? But it's the ingredients in the cake that make the cake the cake, right? So um, it, it's just, yeah, I've got, I, including all the teams I ever served with and all the places I ever served, I have, and I got goosebumps right now thinking about them all. I'm seeing their heads right in front of my mind. I mean, I got the best team I've ever worked with ever right now. It's amazing. And that's so wonderful to hear, uh, which I know that the team is what gets you to places, right? It, it, it's, it's been said, and, and a lot of people have heard, you want to go uh, fast, go alone. You want to you wanna make this thing something that you'll talk about to your grandchildren? Go together, right? Take take a group. Um, and so taking that group mentality, tell, tell me a little bit about what uh, the future looks like for Vets to PM. <laughs> So I've always set rather audacious goals, right? Jim Collins, great books, good to great, built the last couple of those books. If your leaders haven't, if your listeners haven't read those, I, I would encourage every business leader to read them. Along with Jack Stack's book, The Great Game of Business. It's one of my perennial favorites. I read it annually. It's required reading for my company. Um, but yeah, the future, two big audacious hairy goals. The first was when we started, I'm gonna get DOD and or PMI or both put their arms around me in a public way someday. PMI uh, put us on a joint uh, episode of Montel Williams last year. Uh, so that was pretty cool. And then, uh, like I said, DOD has approved our skill bridge program. So we're literally taking vets right out of service, HR, general management or entrepreneurship, cybersecurity, project and program management, literally building them portfolios, zooming with them, slacking with them every day, giving them hybrid projects, agile projects, whatever. Um, they present with a portfolio of experience and two to three credentials a piece so that they show up there fluent and they can prove it and they crush interviews. And in fact, most of the companies we work with Dude, the contract doesn't even expire. And they're calling us back and they're like, hey, can we have like a half a dozen more? We'd love one every single quarter so we can build in some continuity. Like talk about a beautiful unintended consequence. We never saw that. So to recalibrate Doc's new vision, <laughs> I believe in this book so much. And let me give you an example real quick and I'll, uh, to, to galvanize my point. So let's say, and you, and you guys remember back to when you were coming out, right? Let's say you're sitting in an interview and they happen to mention either the hiring manager singular or the hiring panel uh, plural. Somebody mentions the word P and L or they drop A and R or they drop J I T or fiduciary responsibility. What you should be hearing as somebody who knows the language of management is, Hey, this job that they're interviewing me for, I'm going to be the guy in charge of the revenue generation and the cost control, i.e. the profit creation, because I've got fiduciary responsibility. How do they know whether you're any good at fiduciary responsibility, i.e. the responsibility to generate revenue and control costs, whatever? The profit and loss statement, it's literally the scoreboard. Are you generating any revenue? Are you controlling expenses? Are you generating any profit? If that answer is no, you're not generating profit, you're fired. It's a scoreboard and it's pretty objective. But if you're in an interview and they say PL and you got no idea what they just said, the interview's over right there, regardless of how much more time expires in the interview. They know you don't know what they're talking about. And so you're not, you're underqualified. You'll get a letter that says so, because I got eight of them in my career. I know. But if you know what PL is, now flip that coin. If you know what PL is, Enrique, you say it to me and I say, Hey, yeah, let me tell you about the last place I was at where I had responsibility to generate revenue and control costs. Brother, I just separated myself from every other vet they interviewed probably, unless they've read this book, right? Because you know what they're talking about. You are now as qualified as any civilian you're gonna interview. So I say all that to say this, Doc, what's the new vision? I would love for this thing to be the textbook and tap class. That's what I'd love. DOL, buy these from me in bulk. I'll give them a good discount. I know the guy who wrote it. 
The second thing is, is how cool would it be if corporate America provided a book to every veteran new hire? Because if we do that, brother, we're helping with my personal mission. You're not taking 12 years to figure it out. You're not, you're not looking at a firearm in a way that you've never looked at a firearm before in one night because it's so dark, right? You're just not because you can earn a paycheck because you can talk, you can thrive. You can, you can continue to be that difference maker that you've always been. Just like, man, we needed a, a formative experience to go from civilian to soldier, sailor, airman, marine. What are the norms? What are the customs? When do you salute? How do you salute? Who do you salute? What do you wear? Why whites and why blues? Like, you got to learn all that stuff. Right now, they can't teach you that stuff in a week-long tap class. And I'm in tap class nowadays, man, so much better than when I was in, brother. It was a three-day sign the roster class. They gave you a three-ring binder, nine inches thick, and didn't tell you how to read the thing. And I'm a welder, brother. I can read blueprints. That's about it. So my point is, you know, there was no LinkedIn, man. Al Gore was still creating the internet, <laughs> right? Like, so, you know, it's, so it's gotten so much better, but, uh, but yeah, I think regardless of what career you go into, if you, if you know what p &L means, that interview continues. So anyway, there's, there's the vision. That is an amazing vision, my man. Like I said, hashtag nuclear, man. Back to <laughs> PM. Uh, that is a great book. It's also, it's definitely welcome and needed for veterans. You mentioned how you all cal calibrated to COVID. Kudos to you there. And you also talk about leadership creating the heat. So let's talk about that heat. Let's talk about leadership development, your professional development areas that you work on to improve your capabilities of a leader. What are those? Well, so first of all, you know, you mentioned humility is one of my favorite words, right? There's a real fine line between confident and cocky, like arrogant, right? Like, like rubbing people the wrong way, right? But you got to know what you know, and you got to know what you don't know, okay? So for me, I have trouble with blind spots, right? You get good at something, you get learn something, you know something, you've done something a thousand times, it, you autopilot it, right? You rise to the level of your training. So for me, I've trained the team, I demonstrate it, I model it. We have courageous candor conversations. We're all adults, we're all professionals. The mission's more important than any one of us individually. Help each other with blind spots, bring it up. If you don't, you're hurting the team, you're hurting the mission, you're hurting our customer. The second thing is, and, and I hate to be cliche about this, but leadership is not a destination. Leader is not, a, a, I mean, we call it a title in the civilian world. Leader means civilian executive. Oh, so by the way, here's another door prize for your listeners. When you say, hey, I'm a leader to a civilian hiring manager, hey, I'm gonna lead this thing. What they just heard is you're the executive because leader means executive to them. But they look at your resume and you've got 25 years Navy. You don't have 25 years Navy industry. So how can you possibly be the guy at the top of their or the gal at the top of their thing if you don't, you know what I mean? So leadership to me is a function of management. It's one of the four functions of management. And it's an art. It's a science. What, what General Eisenhower say, the art of leadership is getting others to do what you need done because they want to do it. Right? Um, so always be a student of leadership. Listen to these podcasts, right? Listen to other leaders that have taken some battle scars learning to be good because you can learn how not to do stuff, right? Without taking a battle scar yourself as easy as you can learn how to do stuff. Um, so those are the two big things that I kind of try and focus on every day to make sure that I'm walking the talk, which, you know, raising pets and kids, man, they, they do what you do, not what you say. When we talk about leadership, I, I, and I love that you, you, you highlighted the way you did, because there are so many ambiguities when people try to describe and put a definition to what leader is. Um, and, and we know what the good and the bad and the ugly looks like. Um, but there are so many emerging leaders now, right? We, we were one. Uh, at once those emerging leaders as we were growing up. What sort of advice can you provide to emerging leaders coming up now, especially with this uh, dynamic uh, pandemic era uh, that we'll be in, uh, Lord knows how long, uh, but you know they're, they're going to have to grow anyway, whether there's a pandemic or not. 
So they're go growing and, and they need advice. What would you tell them? So a couple key things, Enrique, I would say. Now, I always present what I'm, so I know very little about a lot of stuff, okay? But what I know is business, because that's what the PhD is. Stay in my lane, business. Okay, so when I, when I give answers, it's in that very narrow framework or context of the organization is paying you to be an agent of it. You're its manager. You're supposed to make it profitable and achieve organizational outcomes, just like you would as a chief or a sergeant major or, you know, a colonel, like a captain of the ship, whatever you're doing. It's your organization, but it's serving a higher echelon, if you will, right? Okay. Always, the only thing you have in the game is integrity. I was hired as a 35-year-old intern at a DOD component agency. That was a that was a weird spot to be in in life, let me tell you that. But I'm hired as a 35-year-old intern. And the old finance colonel I worked for told me something that changed my entire civil service career. And I still do it to this day as a, as a chief financial officer. You only get one chance to mishandle somebody's money. You're their financial manager, you're their CFO. Integrity is all you got. They'll forgive a lot of other sins, man, but that one, right? Have integrity, don't fudge stuff, tell the truth, that kind of stuff. The second thing is, is kind of back to the leadership thing. Uh, my, my Air Force retired chief mass sergeant, my COO teaches me this daily, is because they do this in the Air Force. We call it deck plate leadership in the Navy, but it's, uh, it's servant leadership. There is, no, there is no need for the team without a mission. And without, a, and without the team, I, I can't do mission, right? So, so I've got to keep both of them. I got to keep that dynamic tension between both of them. The only way that happens is to serve them. They're not here to serve me, right? I mean, what Sun Tzu say thousands of years ago, when the battle is won, the soldiers should celebrate and the leader should be absent in the conversation, in the celebration. Now, I'll know you led, but they executed, right? So um, servant leadership is another one. Advice I give, serve your stakeholders, serve your organ, figure out what they want. Everybody's favorite radio station, right? Tune them in with them. What's in it for me? Your capabilities and your value does what for your organization? Does what for your department, division, unit, team? Does what for the individuals that make that up? How do you serve them? You'll get yours on the back end. When they're successful and they're crushing goals and stuff, management will see that stuff. They'll, you'll get promoted. You'll start your own companies, all right? And speaking of promotions, there would be the second thing too is get good at telling stories, right? That's why I went into finance. I was a project manager and I figured out quickly that one thing I could do to set myself apart that my peers couldn't is I could speak time and money. I could speak dollar and days, right? Because in a civdiv, it's not bullet beans, band-aids, so you can execute mission. It's how do I make money, save money, or how do I save time, which at some point downstream becomes money, right? Time is money in the civdiv. So if you can get real good about conveying clearly concisely and competently how you contribute value around the place. And that big V is a lot bigger than the small salary they give you. You win all day long. You win all day long. That's what I call the, the production and promotion math. But anyway, there would be my three, my three takeaways on how do you stand out, right? And those will lead down the path to mentorship, right? I have had in my life, probably six or eight great mentors that didn't see the piece of coal. They didn't see a block of marble, thick headed marble head. They saw a statue in there and they applied a little bit of pressure at the right points at the right time. And we know what happens when, when you do that with coal, right? Uh, that's amazing. You know, great advice for emerging leaders. Definitely. You're going to have your own podcast and you're going to do great man because uh, you have some great pros and wisdoms there. Um, let's talk about now some challenges because we all have to face challenges. Having those battle scars mean something, right? They share us lessons. So let's talk about well, how you handle challenges you face or currently facing. Well, so I kind of alluded to the COVID, um, but, but what I think 
the bigger thing uh, is, you know, it's, it's called a black swan event, right? So in statistics, it's the one event. And Enrique defined it. I mean, that's what a black swan event. It's that one thing that we didn't even know could come. And it showed up on our doorstep and, and you know, ate our lunch. So a couple of things as a leader I do is once I've seen something, I believe in empirical evidence, right? I'm a PhD, right? I'm trained to look at things critically, analyze data, draw findings, make conclusions like, yeah, I use hunches too. We're in business, right? But when and where available, I try to make them data-driven, critically thought out, analytic, informed decision-making. Well, gather as much information as you can. So one of the things that we have now built into our company is black swans are out there. We just don't know they exist yet. And that's literally the key note for that entire book, Black Swan uh, from Nassim Tlaib. Uh, but hey, this needs, this needs to be built into our calculus now. For example, 2021, our first meeting of the year, our strategic meeting, I got the team together and said, hey, I want every one of you to tell me yes or no, thumb up or thumb down, Roman voting and agile, right? Do you think COVID gets fixed this year or not? Period. And once they all looked at each other on a Zoom call and had the realization that, gee whiz, this ain't Doc's idea. This isn't what he thinks. This is what we all think. This ain't getting fixed this year. And maybe it does. I mean, good Lord willing, it does, right? But now that I know what bad looks like, we better calibrate to bad because that's where the battlefield is. It's not what we want it to look like. It's what it does look like. So we went to a very painful, yet very informative, enlightening, educating process about, okay, if this is how we're going to sustain, how are we going to do that? Let's battle plan that out. And that's what we did. And we're executing now. And, you know, so far it's, it's, it's working. It's, it's doing exactly what we thought it would do uh, exactly to the metrics we thought it would produce. Yeah. I love how you, uh, you know, just give us that picture of what that looks like, right? That I could, I could just imagine that Zoom meeting when that uh, topic comes up because it truly is something external to all organizations. This is an external influence on our internal, uh, you know, happenings. Yeah. And uh, you, you can never ever truly strategize uh, effectively and efficiently to something you don't even know what, what it looks like. Um, so now we do have what, you know, well, close to, close to some nuclear <laughs> event or some world climatic <laughs> event that will just devastate us all. This is as bad as we've have ever seen uh, as, as a human race, right? Uh, all collectively, all at once. Um, so it, it requires strategies uh, after the event, right? Uh, hopefully you can implement, and that's what you're talking about, you're implementing these strategies now so that when the next ugly thing comes up, you can say, okay, this is how we're gonna pivot because here it goes, that's what we talked about. And, and now it's here, so let's do what we plan. So those strategies take um, some great thinking. And so how do you guys deal with uh, creating these strategies to uh, be implemented when the next change comes? So great question, Enrique. And it actually, it, it kind of pulls together a couple of disparate threads from uh, what I was just saying. So to answer your question, short answer, which is tough for me to do, inclusion, innovation, creativity, experimentation, fail fast, right? Fail forward fast. Like that's really the strategies and tactics I've used with the team. And it goes back to having that servant leadership mindset, understanding I'm not the smartest cat in this room, right? All of you have great ideas. You're all smart. You're all living through the same stuff I am. And it's your company too. So, so how do we get do this as a team? It's not about me, right? So, so there's the specific strategies, Enrique. Include the team, allow them to be creative, give them responsibility, accountability, and authority to make decisions and fail. Because how do human beings learn? I'm raising a boy. How does he learn? By failure. We're experimental critters, right? So to create an environment where 
where mistake making is not acceptable is counter productive. It's counter innovative, innovative, right? And what do you need during a black swan event? I don't know. I've only lived through one in my entire life, but I will tell you innovation and creation and agility kind of really has helped us. So I'm assuming it's, it's a one data point sample size. It's not scientific. So I I'm extrapolating. I'm, I'm, it, it's anecdotal, <laughs> but it sure seemed to help us and companies that I know that I consult with that are successful have done the same things to some degree. And those that didn't innovate, those that didn't include those that let blind spots persist. I, I, I don't know where they are, but I don't hear from them. Definitely need innovation, creativity, and inclusion. Those definitely are great strategies to have. You shared a lot of pearls of wisdom, my man. Eric Doc Wright is here with us. And folks that are listening is like, man, how do I get a hold of that young man? Or how do I get a hold of Vets 2 p.m.? What do you say to them? Perfect. So let's do the one that matters to the listeners first. Vets 2 p.m. is at www.vets2pm.com right? Um, and that's two uh, in the, in the uh, cardinal number two. And then if you want to find me, I'm at LinkedIn, Doc Wright, right? The handle. And I am always, for your listeners, I am always at eric at vets2pm.com for emails or calendly.com forward slash Doc Wright for phone calls. Get on my calendar. Let's have a chat, right? So because I've learned to do what I've learned to do, I also coach VOBs on the side. That's how I'm involved with Favob and GovCon Summit, stuff like that. So, you know, again, it's about sharing lessons learned from battle scars. You ain't got to take the same battle scar I took if you can learn from me. That's, uh, that's wonderful. And, and uh, Doc, it's been a pleasure to have you. Uh, such a, a greater pleasure to see you because, uh, I mean, yeah, you're always a blessing. So, uh, so thank you for being with us today. Um, and for those listening, we're going to have that information as part of the video, part, part of the show notes. Uh, and if you would like to contact us here at the Leadership Void podcast, the leadership void at gmail.com is our email. If you want us to cover a leadership topic, if you have a speaker that you would like to see, as a guest, please send us that information. Um, we're also interested in uh, wearing your swag. We got our swag on today, but hey, Doc, we would love to wear that that VIB, uh, you know, network shirt. Uh, so uh, if anybody uh, listening, you have a company, a veteran-owned company, you want us to wear uh, your shirt or your or, or T-shirts or anything like that, just send it our way. You can email us and we'll get you the information. Uh, but uh, Doc, uh, a great pleasure to have you. Uh, what you've shared, uh, it's going to be gold for, for it's definitely gold for us. It's going to be gold for them. So thank you so much. Well, thank you both for the opportunity, man. Uh, super humbled and super stoked to participate. Oh, thank you, Doc. Again, and for those listeners also, one last thing. We do our radio check, which is our time to check in with each and every one of our battle buddies. We could talk about battle scars. We could talk about how to connect, how to share resources like this great book that was shared, how to translate your, your military, your MOS, or your AFSC to a civilian workforce. You know, hey, we meet every 1st and the 15th, 1900, 7 o'clock, LinkedIn Live. We changed it up a little bit. We'll see you on May 1st. And next week, we sit down with another dynamic leader, another veteran in the San Diego County of California. So stay tuned. But today we honor Doc for being here, Doc Wright. Thank you again, as he can mention, great pearls of wisdom, nuclear, go recalibrate in COVID and you've got some things going. Thank you again. Thanks guys.